plus plus this is recorded for uh, everyone's benefit. So hello everyone, welcome to the October 2021 meeting of the Central Florida Astronomical Society. We have a great program for you tonight. Uh, we're going to have a few standard announcements uh, and then we're going to kind of cut it short so that our main speaker Peter can uh, talk to us about um, the moon, one of my favorite uh, astronomical topics. Uh, when he's done, of course, we'll have more announcements and news to talk about. And it is October. It's time for our annual officer elections. Uh, Derek Demeter and Frank King will be running that uh, via a, a Zoom poll uh, for the voting. And then we'll have our mini programs um, Derek with uh, Astro Member Photos and Sketches Showcase. John Pinto is going to talk about where is it. I'm going to spend just a minute on the moon. Bill Castro is going to talk about astronomical sketching, which uh, I'm very anxious to hear that talk. And then uh, our other board member at large, Eric Hoyne, is going to wrap up the program with several minutes on the sun. So our standard announcements at the beginning of the show every time for the benefit of our YouTube audience as well. Uh, remember, all official member CFIS communication is through Groups IO. Uh, I heard tell that somebody hadn't heard about our star party last weekend. Well, it went out on Groups IO and it was on the Groups calendar. Uh, so that is the best way to keep up with things that are going on with all things CFIS. Also, if you're not a member and you want to join, join. We have a website, CFIS.org, an award-winning website. Uh, and uh, you, uh, membership information is there and you can join there and, and find out more information about the club. So all the other boring announcements, well, they're not boring, some of them are quite exciting actually. We're gonna save until after our main program. Um, Trisha, do you wanna take over and introduce our guests? And then when you're finished, I'll stop screen sharing and he can take over and we'll be off to the races. Hey Richard, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, yes. Okay, so let me tell you guys a little bit about Peter before he starts. So Peter is an avid astronomer whose interests cover a wide range of astronomical, a wide range of the astronomical spectrum. For 35 years, he was the director of the Boyertown Planetarium, where he gave programs to over half a million people. He is a recipient of the Thomas Brennan Award from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific for an exceptional achievement related to teaching high school astronomy. He teaches an astronomy course at Montgomery County Community College, Moravian College, and Montana State University. In research, he has co-authored numerous papers on eclipse, eclipsing binaries and contributes data to the AAVSO, ALPO, IMO, and IOTA. He is also the observatory director for the Mars, <clears throat> for the Mars Society in Utah, where he heads up the astronomy team providing a solar and a robotic telescope for their members at the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. He also provides training for a robotic telescope in New Mexico as a lead astronomer for the Montana Learning Center. Both robotic telescopes are used remotely by students around the world. So everyone at CFIS, let me welcome Peter Dieterlein. Yay. <laughs> clap, 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 clap. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. The screen's all yours. Thank you, Tricia. I can share a screen. I have host disabled participant screen sharing. We're fixing that. Oh, right there we right go. Now. And we're good now. Okay. Awesome. I'm there. I'm there. Okay. Everybody sees the screen. Are we all good? I take that as a yes. Hey, it is a pleasure yes, to be with, <laughs> thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, be here tonight to talk to you about the moon. And uh, Trisha and I go way back to the Mars Society and spent some time out in the desert uh, working at the Mars Hab out there and talking about all sorts of different things astronomical. But tonight I wanna take a look instead of the Mars Society, I wanna look at the moon, something a little bit closer. And all of you have gone out to take a look at the moon. You show people the moon through the telescope all the time. You have some few minutes on the moon. I'm looking forward to actually hearing that. I think I'll stick around for uh, your meeting. But I would like you to take a look at the moon a little bit differently tonight, an evolutionary way to view the moon. So when you show off the moon to all the people who come up to your telescopes, you might have 
a little more information you can share with them and some more data. So let's get started. And we'll begin at the beginning. The solar system is just forming. It's about 5 billion years ago or so, and we've got the solar nebula and it's collapsing in the sun. We now have this proto star at the middle of this thing just starting to heat up. And circles of gas are starting to move themselves around it and there's beginning to condense. This condensation, this changing from a gas into a liquid, makes little droplets that start to stick together, jam together, accretion, we call it, creating planetesimals, something the size of a basketball slams into something the size of a desk slams into something the size of Delaware, that kind of thing, getting bigger and bigger. Eventually, depending what you read, Scientists feel there were about 100 planets vying for position between where Mercury and Mars are today, four one out. Eventually the largest bodies just keep getting larger and larger, sweeping out their area, collecting all this material, becoming eventually our planets. So we go through this process, but late in the game, there are actually two planets that are in the Earth's orbit. And let's see, according to this graphic, one of them looks surprisingly like the planet Venus without clouds and the other one looks exactly like Mars. That's okay. Uh, the size of Mars is about correct. And when these two collided and had this giant collision, merged to become a little bit larger, but more importantly, spit off a chunk of the earth to become the moon. This is a really, interesting thing that's happened here. The moon is a quarter the size of the earth. Forgetting Pluto because it's not a planet anymore, the next largest ratio is 172nd. Our moon is incredibly large compared to our own planet. So the moon forms about four and a half billion years ago. We've got the collision between these two giant protoplanets. They merge to become the earth, and they break a section off that will become our moon. So the moon's formed from the debris that's ejected out from the earth itself. Now, some interesting things happened. With this collision, our new planet also is now tilted a bit, giving us our seasons. And the collision has also increased the rotation rate of the Earth. It starts to speed it up. So the Earth is rotating faster. Not really sure exactly how fast, depending what scientists you listen to, could be a six hour day or an eight hour day, but incredibly fast. I mean, can you imagine six or an eight hour day? You'd be a mess if you didn't get your two hours of sleep every night. I mean, this is really moving very, very quickly. But the moon, just by its mass and its pull as it goes around, is going to eventually slow the Earth down. So it'll give it its 24-hour day. And eventually, we'll have a 25-hour day in about um, 180 million years from now or so. You're all familiar with this one, the Big Dipper. When our moon first formed, it was very, very close to the Earth. In our nighttime sky, the moon would fit inside the Big Dipper. It would be a nice fit. It's not gonna to be too tight. It's not gonna be real loose. It's gonna be gigantic in the sky, in other words. When you look at the Big Dipper, I want you to take a look at that and see if you can Imagine the moon being so large it would fit up the entire bowl. It was only 18,000 miles away. Our geosynchronous satellites were 21,000 miles away. So you're looking at something even a little closer than that. And the moon is slowly drifting further back and back and back and back every year. It only drifts about an inch and a half a year. That's all. 
just an inch and a half in a year. But today, here's the size of our moon. It still looks huge in our nighttime sky. We can still see with our own eyes detail on the moon without any optical aid. It's beautiful. And it keeps getting smaller and smaller. This is why seeing a total solar eclipse is so very important. You don't want to miss them because the moon keeps inching further and further away. Eventually, you're just not going to have them anymore. I mean, let's see, that'll happen in about 600 million years. So you really want to see these things now before that happens. And of course, now it's about a quarter of a million miles away. So the big question, how did the moon get to look the way it does? Of course, we've got the side of the moon that we see over here. We have the Copernicus over here. We've got the sea of rain, the ocean of storms, the sea of serenity, crisis, and the far side of the moon. The big feature that you see down here, the South Polar Aitken Basin, one of the largest impact basins in the entire solar system. Absolutely gorgeous, huge, old. See Moscow up here. We can take the moon and we've discovered that we can split it up into six different periods, six different evolutionary periods during its history. And that's what we wanna look at today. You know, when you're at a star party and they're out there and it's Jupiter season, it's giant planet season, Saturn, Jupiter, you're going to be showing them that. And they're going to be like, oh my gosh, look at those rings of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter and the bands and belts. And you know, when you go to the moon and that person has never looked through a telescope before, their whole demeanor is going to change. Their eyes are going to get wide. They're going to be like, when do we land? It's just amazing to be able to see the moon through a telescope. And then you'll go on to show them your favorite craters and mountains and mare and tell different stories about them. Let's add some evolutionary stuff to that as well. So let's get started. You are going to need paper and a pencil. Got a little quiz to get us going. I'll give you a moment. Got a couple of things I want you to write down here. Paper and a pencil. Just have to jot a few things down. Six evolutionary periods. What I would like you to do is take a look at these six objects, and I would like you to put them in order from oldest to youngest. Now, all of these are lunar sketches that I've done. I'm, I'm doing sketches with this only because I don't want you to get wiped away with the background then. I'll show you the actual pictures a little bit later. All the moon images in here are mine um, and sketches. But what I would like you to do is take a look at these, look at each crater and try to figure out which one's the oldest, which one is the youngest, put them in some kind of order. Let's see what you can do with that. Think about how you would pull that off. If you have access to your chat screen, why don't you tell me what you think is the oldest? Let me know where you're at in this process here. Is that possible?
getting some good answers in. This is great. Clavius, Landris, Kepler, Clavius, Clavius. Landris, Thebe. I figure craters within craters take some time. It seems like a logical assumption. Put the rest in order. Okay. All right, let's take a look. Are we all good? The oldest one is the Landris, pre-Nectarian. It is one of the older craters on the moon, four and a half to 3.92 billion years ago. And if we look at this thing, it almost looks like a square crater at this point. The walls in this thing are really, really degraded. They're eroded away. You don't really have a strong issues with that at all. You've got lots of craters, little craterlets inside, rows of craters here. This is really old and beaten down. Pre-Nectarian, there are not a lot of pre-Nectarian period craters up there. So if you can find one and show them to your guests and say, that's one of the oldest craters out in the moon. It's a pretty cool thing and explain to them why. Broken down walls, lots of stuff. The, the, the center of this thing is just tortured, just really tortured. The next one would be Clavius. Look at the center of this one compared to what you had for Delandris. You still have lots of craters inside of this thing and the walls are still degraded. Looks like it's really eroded off into here, a little bit off into there, lots of bigger craters. This certainly is an older one. This is from the Nectarian period. And as the name suggests, this happened when the Nectarian Taurus Basin formed. That's where the Nectarian period comes. So the Nectarus Basin is your oldest sea, mare, on our side of the moon. So that's something else you can point out at star parties. It's really kind of interesting. So we've got the ejecta from that. And the ejecta from that made a lot of these older craters that we see, like Clavius, up in the lunar highlands, things that are close by. Okay, what's our next one? Thebit. Thebit, of course, we know and love because it's right next to Rupus Recta, our straight wall right here. Looks kind of like a sword with a blade, scabbard and a handle coming down. Very, very cool feature. And we've all looked at that. We love that. That's really neat. And Thebit's right next to it. Again, look at the floor, how tortured that is. But the rim of it is not as eroded as what we saw with the Nectarian period. It's a little firmer. It looks a little bit better than that, although we've got a huge, large crater here from a much younger period that, of course, has fallen across that part of it. Now, the early Imbrium period, and these are the two toughest ones for me. I get these things. I find them difficult. Early embryum and late embryum. I think they just call it embryum, and I think we'd all be fine. But this is where we get the Sea of Crisis and Tranquility and the Ocean of Storms and a lot of the major seas that we have at this time. This is where they're going to come from. And also some of the craters on there. And Thebet is one of them. 
or next is Patavius. And looking at it, I'd almost think Patavius is older than Thebet. And I'm looking at the crater wall for that. It doesn't seem as sharply defined as what you have for Thebet, although the floor looks a lot younger than what you have for Thebet. So the early and the late Imbrium are Well, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Let's see if we can't get Peter back online. Yeah, I'm going to email him now, Richard. Okay. There he is. Oh, I see him. He's muted. Okay, I'm back. Everybody can hear me. We're all good. Yes. 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 Can you still see my screen, or do I have to share again? I think share. you have to share again. I don't know what happened there. Okay, I think we're good, right? I see you. You're good. All right. Timocrius, Eratosthenian period. Eratosthenes, of course, being one of the major ones for that too. Craters from this period are really sharply defined. The, the big difference between this and the last one, the Copernican, they don't have rays. They don't have rays, but the crater walls are really sharp. They're well-defined. There's very little erosion going on here. They just don't have a ray system. 3.2 to 1.1 billion. And the Copernican period, our last one, here's Kepler. And of course you can see the rays coming out from this. And this makes sense. You have this huge impact, it blasts out the lighter material, it goes flying all over the place. You get your rays. There's nothing to degrade that over time. Anything with rays is going to be younger. Those will be your youngest features. Copernican period goes from 1.1 billion years ago to present day. And of course, we're talking about Kepler, we're talking about Copernicus, we are talking about the most famous of any of the ray craters. And that, of course, is. Tycho. It's an amazing crater. You are looking at the youngest, the youngest large crater on the moon. I can't say youngest crater, there might be some really small little things that have hit, but this is the youngest large crater. Looking at this thing, look at the walls of it coming around, very sharply defined nice mountain in the middle, rays spreading out all the way across the moon in this thing, of course, looking like the navel of an orange. What's really interesting about Tycho, it's only 108 million years old, only 108 million years old. That's pretty amazing, because if you really think about that, 108 million years ago, was actually the time of the dinosaurs. We're talking the Cretaceous period. So during that time, the moon had a huge impact and that must have been amazing, absolutely amazing. So let's review six historical periods, pre-Nectarian, Nectarian, and pre-Nectarian is before the Nectaris Basin, after the Nectaris Basin, that's your Nectarian period, that's your earliest Mari. Imbrium Basin is the next big one. And with that, we start to get in the late Imbrium, we're gonna get the Sea of Crisis, we're gonna be getting the Sea of Tranquility, Serenity, Ocean of Storms, all starting to appear there, off into the late. 
which is after the Oriental Basin. And then of course the Eratosthenian period, lack of rake craters, and then the Copernican with rake. Let's go through one more time and then we're going to take a look at it and see what you can do with some others. Pre-Nectarian. First major impact on the moon is believed to be that South Pole Aitken Basin 4.3 billion years ago. Now, it's at the South Pole, but most of it, the basin really appears on the far side of the moon. So we're not really going to get a good shot of that. But that was the first thing we believe that really struck the moon. That seems to be the oldest. The Nectarian period. Heavy bombardment. This is the start of your heavy bombardment period, starting with uh, Mare Nectaris and some of the lunar highlands and Clavius. Imbrium period, early and late, we're talking about volcanoes in the Mare. We're looking at impacts that's going to bring up some of the magma that's going to fill in those large depressions and even some craters. Eratosthenian period. You're now looking at some uh, pretty fresh craters that are coming out there. Still uh, haven't eroded very much. And of course, the last period, the ones with the rays are Copernican. All right, so let's use the chat room again and we'll uh, kind of go through this. You're looking at Mare Nectaris. Mare Nectaris. And this is really a nice one to show like this is the earliest Mare region that we have on our side of the moon. This is where things really got a chance to get started. We've got some craters on the side. The name of the top crater here is just a classic. I know you know it. Uh, let's see it in the chat. What do you have there? You guys know your moon? One of my all time favorites. Anybody put that in the chat? You know that one? This is probably one you show at start parties all the time. It's an easy one because it's off there on that early crescent. All right, that one is Theophilus. That's Theophilus. Katharina Cyrillus. I would like to know the age of each one of these craters. Something easy for you to see at a star party right here on the edge of Mare Nectaris. Let's check it out. A little different angle. Theophilus, Katharina, and Cyrillus. Let's start with Cyrillus first and we'll work our way up. Here's the crater. Very interesting. I've got another crater here with a very low wall. Looks like I got little craterlets that even make a circle on the inside of that, which is kind of fascinating. A few more often here. Give me an idea. And let me know what you're thinking. What period is this from? Are we looking? What I already have Nectarian on there. Sorry, I hit the button. I hit the wrong button. All right, I'll give you that one, Nectarian period. Um, I'd almost think pre-Nectarian with this. It really looks pretty old. I mean, this is kind of eroded off to the side here, but we're missing some stuff. I mean, this crater came in that kind of wiped out the wall there. I still have a bit of a wall going all the way around on the rest. Even down in here, there's still a bit of a wall. So it's not quite pre-Nectarian, it's eroded. But the floor is still somewhat smooth down in here. That'll be Nectarian. Okay, here's Katharina. I'll keep my hand off the button. Take a look at it. And let me know what you think as far as the period. Pre-Nectarian, Nectarian, early embryum, late embryum, Eratosthenian, Copernican. Look at the walls. Look at the floor. 
Look at any other craters. Give me your thoughts. Quite eroded and peppered, yeah. Early embryum, John's going out on a limb there, and Leonard's going to hedge his bets and just say embryum, which makes a heck of a lot of sense to me because they're really tough to tell apart. Looks like everybody's liking the uh, embryum stuff. Let's take a look. Still nectarian. Still nectarian. Yeah, it's um, definitely degraded. I mean, the walls coming off of this thing really look pretty bad. As far as that late embryo, you would have probably more of a, a Mare floor to it, like we saw with Patavius. Probably have more with that. And you can have that with early embryo too, but it's going to be a little more defined in this. The walls are just too eroded. So we're looking at Nectarian for that. And listen, don't feel bad. This is, uh, the easy ones are great. And some of the difficult ones when you get, you feel really good about yourself, but then it's, it's interesting. It's just interesting when you try to figure out where they fit into that scheme. And of course the classic Theophilus, this one should be a little bit easier. What do you got? Again, it's pre-nectarian, nectarian, early embryo, late embryo, eratosthenian, and Copernican. <laughs> Richard's changing his mind. And good move, yes. Look at the walls of the crater. They're pretty sharp. They're really well-defined. You don't have a lot of craters in the floor of this thing. It is on the younger side. Good mountain ranges in the middle, very classic, right? This is uh, definitely a beauty, but it does not have rays. And that's the big deal. So it's the Eratosthenian period. No rays, sharp crater. No rays. Good job. How about Grimaldi? When I was checking this out, this is the first one I tried. And I absolutely got the answer wrong in this thing. Let's see what you can do. Grimaldi's not a huge star party one unless uh, it could be if it's after full moon. Or just uh, coming up to full moon, but usually you don't do star parties then. Okay, so we're looking at the walls. We're looking at the floor, right? That's the two stuff. Those are the two things we want to look at. How messed up is the floor? <laughs> That's the one big thing. And how steep are the walls? Are they, how eroded are they? Are they broken down anywhere going along?
So we got some ideas here. We've got late embryum, nectarian. I'm going with pre-nectarian or nectarian. Come on, Richard, pick a side. Late embryum. <laughs> Pre-nectarian, huh? When I first looked at this thing and started going through, and it was my very first one I'm trying. I'm going to start with Grimaldi. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, it's got the Mare floor. So I'm thinking embryo. I'm thinking embryo. Probably late embryo, maybe. But of course, it's got a lot of craters. And the walls aren't really high, kind of eroded. So I went to early embryo. Give it a little more chance for craters to build up, that kind of thing. And I'm sticking to it. And the answer is prenectarian. That is prenectarian. Yeah. And it really is old. It does look old. You're right. And it definitely uh, has a floor that had some lava come in at one point, probably erased uh, quite a few craters and other uh, stuff that's down the bottom, still had time to collect more stuff. It is definitely degraded. The walls are very, very low off in this thing. But this is one that if you're at a star party and Grimaldi is up, you can actually show them and say, this is one of the older areas in the moon, very old feature. What about Plato? Ah, my favorites, love Plato. I always love imaging this because I know I have a good image if I can get the craterlets in the inside of this thing. Those little craterlets right in there. You can look at the walls in this thing, how sharp they are. It's got the lava floor. What's your thought? Prenectarian, nectarian, early embryo, late embryo, Eratosthenian, Copernican. Those people are loving that late embryo. Answer is early. Yeah, um, I said late too. I think of my initial thought on this thing. I was thinking late and I'm like, ugh. early and late always get me messed up. But understand that the early embryo happened with the formation of the embryo, um, Mari embryo. Now, I'm thinking, therefore, late embryo, this happened afterwards, the thing fell on, still got some lava coming in. But apparently, this happened during that time. It still had some molten stuff come up onto the inside of this. But it is early embryo and not late. But I agree, I keep thinking it's late, too. How about the lunar Alps? Alpine Valley, Lunar Alps. What are we thinking there? Doesn't have to just be craters or Mare. We need to know when all these features came in. Think about how mountains form on the moon, though. That'll help. And where they're located will help. Ralph's right next to Plato, right? Seeing pre nectarian, seeing nectarian.
Eratosthenian. That might be from the other one though. The lunar Alps are located right off Mare Imbrium, right? And you have to realize when an impact comes in, it smashes in, it throws up material on the outside to make the walls of the crater, or in this case, the walls of the Mare. Those turn into mountain ranges. So it's got to be in the Imbrium period. And it'll be early Imbrium. So as soon as this thing came in, it blasted the mountains coming around, also gave you the, uh, the Apennine Mountains and the Jura Mountains coming around that as well, which all bounded, formed the boundary for this thing going through. So they were all formed in that very early Imbrium period. Aristarchus. That should be an easy one for you. Finally, right? One of the most beautiful areas up on the moon. Proud of this right here with this delta coming through the mountains, Agricola back here. Just a, a really interesting area. And the answer to this is going to be Copernican. It does have the rays. Now they're not overly, I can see them on here. They're kind of lighter colored, but that's just my image trying to see more detail inside the crater and the area around it. But it definitely is one of the younger, it's the brightest crater on the moon. It is the brightest one. And it's very young because of that. It definitely has rays coming through. It's definitely Copernican. Hey, good job. You wanna write this uh, down, the virtual moon atlas. This is a really, really, really good resource because you're gonna to wanna to find your own favorite items on the moon. We're obviously not gonna have time to go through everything. And once you do that, you'll have to download it in the computer, but just type in what you want. It'll say it's a crater, and then it says geologic period, Copernican. That's great. So no matter what feature you put on there, it's going to tell you the geologic period it's from. And that's really kind of cool. So I would suggest if you're going to play the game with this and take a look, make your own guess first before you go to this and uh, let that be your guide. Sourceforge.net projects virtual moon. Now, the idea from this really comes from the Astronomical League. And I work with a lot of their different programs because I think they're great and I, I try to get my students involved with them. Because it's a wonderful way to start to look at the sky. And what are we doing? The moon's up there anyway, right? So the Astronomical League has their lunar observing program. They have to observe 100 objects. And it's really just a great way to learn the classic craters, mare, features of the moon and be able to say you saw them. That's really a nice way to go. And you get a pin and a certificate at the end. The Lunar 2 Club is interesting too, because you're looking at another 100 objects, but from what I learned in this one, every time I would look at it, I would stare at it and think, what is unique and interesting that they decided to add it to this club? And it could be a volcanic vent on the moon. It could be a lunar volcano. It could be a crater that's actually submerged. 
there's a lot of really cool and interesting things in this that you would have be able to see. So it's really takes you a little step further as you're going through. A lot of them, you're really going to need to have the correct lighting. So you want to get this thing at sunrise or sunset. And our third one with the moon is the lunar evolution. You're looking at 57 objects and you're going to determine the evolutionary period of them, just like we did here today. And it's really kind of fun to look at it and see it. And you get one right and you feel really excited to get one wrong. I'm like, oh, seriously? And then you're trying to figure out exactly how this thing came together. But after a while, given enough time and enough practice, you'll be able to pull that off. And it's really a new way and an interesting way to take a look at an old friend and to be able to figure out what's happening on the moon and be able to share that to people at your parties. Any questions, anything you have for me? You know, Peter, I'm not seeing any questions in the uh, chat. So guys, if you're listening, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them either in the Q&A chat or the regular chat here so we can ask Peter. Yeah, Robert Sorensen has his hand up. Robert, go ahead and type your question in the Q&A box, unless, unless that's a mistake, that the little hand is up. And we also have, do we know what caused the different periods? Well, it's just like different geologic periods on Earth. As the moon's going through different changes, um, you have heavy bombardment, you're going to get a lot of craters. You've got the things for the Mare coming up. It's just different periods in that history. And basically, we just look at everything that's happened from beginning to end, figure that out, and then split them up into those periods. Does it have to do with the migration of Jupiter and Saturn? Not for this. What we're looking at for the Earth is that collision between those two protoplanets and blasted off a chunk of the Earth. You have a lot of debris, and a lot of that's going to rain. Most of it's going to rain back down on the Earth. But some of it's going to rain back down on the newly forming moon. And until all that stuff starts to settle, the moon is going to start to take shape and form. How do we know which period different features date back to? Is there satellite data that tells us this? I got much smarter people than myself figuring this stuff out. Geologists have been looking at the moon for quite some time. And I'm sure bringing moon rocks back is a great help. But we have been looking at figuring out ages of bodies by looking at craters for a very, very long time. So there's a lot of experience that geologists have with us. Um, planetary geologists. Um, counting craters is one thing to give you the age of something. And they've got this thing figured out. But I'm amazed at how many features they have all this work down through, but that's what they do. Where are you going to view the solar eclipse of 2024? Ah, I've seen six total solar eclipses. And 2024, I live in Pennsylvania. And it goes right by Erie, Pennsylvania. And I taught high school in Erie, my first year of teaching. I had one year up there before I went to Boyertown. So Erie is really kind of close to my heart. And I have to tell you, there is no way I'm going to be in Erie, Pennsylvania on April 8, 2024. It's just not going to happen. I've been in Erie in April, and the weather is way too unpredictable. The chances for clouds are really, really good. So I'm thinking Texas. I'm thinking I'm going to be somewhere in Texas. I'm going to be going out to the Mars Hab next year, as I normally do to work with the telescopes out there. And I go out with a friend of mine, and I think what we're going to do is take the southern route and start looking at some places already to try to figure out where exactly we want to be positioned on our line here. We did that with the last one, too, and it worked out really well. I made a rubric, and we just started kind of going through and picked uh, some good places. I saw the last one in Wyoming. Worked out beautifully. I imagine you guys are going to be heading. Texas will be your closest uh, for you. And you're going to see more of the eclipse down there. And it's decently dry and fairly good in April. Uh, 
Okay, I think that's it for the questions. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Peter. That was that was really great. Thanks, really Richard. Great. Okay, so that means the ball is back in my court. Let's find all the right buttons to press. We're back to more announcements and notes from Cephas. So last weekend's Star Party was a great success, by the way. Uh, we had uh, more than 20 people who came out. I counted 13 uh, setups or mounts with scopes on them. Uh, so it's great. Here's a few pictures of uh, people who brought their scopes. Uh, some of these were taken, of course, before the sun set. Uh, the moon and Venus were putting on a beautiful show uh, before the sun was down. And then uh, just as twilight was hitting, Mars and uh, Saturn were easy to hit. Uh, in interest of social distancing, Eric even uh, brought a little camera and was uh, showing people uh, Saturn uh, and the moon with, uh, with his homemade daub. And so uh, there you go. We are going to do this again on November the 12th, which is a Friday night, weather permitting. Uh, the weather was really quite nice, um, you know, cool. There were a few bugs, but you know, it's, it's at the college. So it's not, uh, it's not like being in the woods somewhere. And uh, everybody was really uh, very friendly and, uh, and cordial with each other. And we didn't have any uh, any issues. So it was, it was really great. It's been over a year and a half since we've been able to get together uh, in person. So this is a really great, um, a really great, a uh, really great time. And again, like I said, next month on Friday, November 12th, uh, if it doesn't rain, we are getting into uh, spats of uh, nice clear uh, runs. So there's actually a, a reasonable chance we may be able to pull that off. So I hope to see uh, some more of you there. Uh, also coming up uh, October 15th, uh, which is just this coming Friday, Trail Life Astronomy Skywatching. If you're interested in uh, helping or attending these events and you want more information, contact Lynn Ward, who is our outreach chair. Uh, his email is on the screen. Also on October 21st, uh, North Lake Park Elementary School, which is a morning event um, with, um, with kids, obviously, at, at the elementary school. And of course, November the 12th, uh, which is Friday at 6 p.m., we'll have our next get together. Also, we have some early news about our December holiday party and our December uh, meeting. Uh, we moved it up a week or back a week. I could never keep it straight which one you say, but it's a week later than it used to be, than it would have been. It's going to be on December 15th, uh, Wednesday at six o'clock. Uh, the reason is the previous Wednesday when we uh, normally do that, they're having uh, classes and final exams. Uh, at the gun range and they don't want us showing up in the middle of that we are going to cater and have food brought in and we're going to have uh we're going to be eating outside and we can set telescopes it'll it'll be a little bit after the geminids uh the moon will be a little past either a little past four or a little before full uh but there's lots of interesting things to look at on the moon maybe we can have a secondary quiz and uh, identify some features there uh that night also, just uh, some reminder, um, International Observe the Moon Night is actually coming up October the 16th. If you're interested, there are some local uh, events. We're not doing any officially. Um, we thought we were, I thought I was going to, and it, I wasn't able to do it. But go to moon.nasa.gov for more information. You can put in your location. Uh, there is an event up in St. Augustine. There's one in uh, Orlando proper, um, and I... I don't remember the other ones, but St. Augustine kind of interested me. And then there's one, of course, in, in Orlando. So go to that website if you are interested. Uh, and maybe you can share some of your newfound knowledge about uh, lunar formations uh, while you're there. Also, uh, as the Alcor chair, the Astronomy League uh, chair for the organization, I got an email uh, asked to announce or uh, remind everyone uh, we do have dates for Alcon uh, next year, uh, July 28th and 30th, and it is going to be in person, in person, uh, and it's going to be in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. I have been to an Alcon. It is not nearly as big and flashy as NEF, which is a bit of an advantage, uh, so it's a little smaller, uh, but it's uh, very heavy on, you know, hands-on, <coughs> excuse me, hands-on observing uh, sorts of activities and speakers 
uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile vacation trip perhaps uh, for you next July. Also, uh, finally, before our election, the Astronomical League uh, sells books and calendars every year. And last year, we took some orders. Uh, there is a bundled deal. Uh, they're going to ship on October the 31st. If you are interested, contact Kent Allingham, uh, K-A-H-A-M-84 uh, at yahoo.com. Uh, there were a number of people on the group's I.O. list who have already vouched and said, hey, I want one. Uh, we're going to go back over that list to make sure uh, we have everybody listed, but if you want to make sure, give Kent uh, a, a holler at his email here. Uh, he is going to place the order Friday, so that's two days from now. Uh, so get your order in. Now, if you miss the order, you can still, of course, order directly from their website, and it, it's a dollar or two more, and I think you have to pay shipping. Uh, but uh, all of them will come in here uh, to Kent, and then uh, you can you can get them from him. And that's the end of the additional announcements and notes and calendar things. We get to the uh, uh, October elections. Um, I'm actually going to kind of be quiet at this point and let uh, Frank take over. I'm going to mute myself, which uh, my family wishes I could do more often. All right, we're turning Richard off because we're going to talk about him. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Frank Kane, your board member at large for a few more minutes. And one of the last things I need to do in my term is to run our annual elections. Fortunately, it's a very easy decision for you because everyone is running unopposed this year. Uh, Richard Wright has volunteered to reprise his role as president, Tricia Smedley as vice president, Kent Allingham as treasurer, and Denise Woody as secretary. And uh, taking my place as board member at large, John Pinto has volunteered to uh, fill that role uh, for the next two years. So, um, all we have to do is kick off a little poll here and you all have to vote on whether or not you would rather have these people or someone named other. So hopefully that's an easy choice for you. Uh, Derek, if you could kick off that poll, we'll uh, get this going. So please take a minute to go through and cast your votes. Do, 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 do. All right, only six out of 20 have responded so far. I think I may have accidentally killed the poll. Uh oh. I'm like, really? Although I meant that I only clicked on this little ellipsis. Relaunch poll. I'm going to relaunch it. Yeah. It's meddling. Meddling in the uh oh now we got to start no, over. We restarted. Okay, if you I'll cast tell you your... what, I'm just gonna keep my hand. I'm gonna go back to being muted and being quiet. <laughs> All right. If you voted before, please vote again. You you don't hear that very often, but um, in this case, it's okay. Oh, All God. right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Seventeen out of twenty. 18 out of 20, I think two people are taking a bathroom break or something. Give them a couple, couple more minutes here. All right, well, we have 90% of the current attendees responding. Uh, nope, 95. Oh, come on, number 20. Let's make it perfect. Going once, going twice. All right, we're going to call this a successful uh, virtual show of hands, and it looks like uh, Richard Wright is unanimously elected our new president again, and Tricia Smedley is our new vice president again. Kent Allingham, unanimous as treasurer, Denise Woody, unanimous as secretary, and John Pinto, unanimous as the new board member at large. So congratulations to our new board, and thank you uh, to all of our elected board members and our unelected uh, appointed committee chairs. Every month, these guys put in a lot of time and effort, and give up a little bit of their sanity to keep the club running. So uh, on behalf of the members, as my last active board member at large, thank you to all of you for all you do. And uh, congratulations. We now have a new board for the coming year. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Hey, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Frank has done a lot uh, for this organization in his uh, tenure as a board member at large, including helping to redesign our <clears throat> award-winning website. And thank you everyone for your confidence. I just want to say that I won easily and I got the most votes of any president ever 
at least this month. So there we are. Um, next up, then we'll get back to business. Um, Derek Demeter, it's time for your curation of astro photos and sketches for the month. So I'm going to again be actually, I need to stop sharing my screen. That would probably help. And then I'm going to be quiet again for a little bit. A good quality. All right. Thanks, Richard. All right. Um, so hello, everybody. Welcome again uh, to our astrophotography showcase. Uh, the weather is getting better, which means that there are more and more people getting and taking advantage of the good weather that we have. Um, so uh, like we usually do, for those that are new to this, um, I'll be sharing the photos. If you do see your photo, uh, you're welcome to, I'll, I'll uh, unmute you and you're welcome to say, um, say something about it. There, I believe is one submission uh, where the certain individual decided they didn't wanna um, make a mention about it. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the, uh, what was available. Um, and I believe uh, two of them, actually, actually both of them uh, are, are members that couldn't join us tonight is what I'm, what I'm saying. Um, so again, if you, see your, um, if you see your photo and I can, and I see you on the attendees list here, uh, if you're interested in sharing some information, that would be wonderful. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Um, let me open up the participants thing here so I can see you. I'm actually gonna go ahead and unmute uh, Elaine. I believe Elaine was on. Oh, no, Elaine, uh, I don't see. I'm here. Is she, oh, you're. Oh, you. Oh, you were upgraded to uh, panels. All right. So Elaine, um, you um, you uh, had kind of a series of photos you wanted to share. So uh, and you had a request for the um, you know the, the the flow of it. So we're going to start out yes. with this one. You. So I'll let you uh, talk about your series of photos here. Okay, um, this is a state park and I was out there to do a prescribed burn and we burned, I believe it was 1200 acres using a helicopter uh, for ignition. Uh, anyway, the area I was posted was adjacent to this spot and we had some caracara, which is a bird of prey, spend some time hanging around because the fire sends up bugs. Some of you should recognize this spot. And Derek, go ahead to the next picture. Oops. Oh, there were two of the Caracara. Okay, go, go ahead back to the Caracara. Do some of you recognize that spot? It's your Astropad. Kissimmee Prairie. Yes, a Kissimmee Prairie Preserve, the Astropad. So we burned all the vegetation around there but we kept all of your facilities safe. Okay, go ahead to the next picture. Um, Eric talks about the moon, or excuse me, about the sun each um, meeting. This was a fire I worked in the area of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. This is a fire camp, um, but sunset, when you have smoke in the air, you get some fabulous sunsets. Okay, go ahead. This was one of the evenings we went out to uh, Bar Street in the uh, Little Big Econ State Forest. You can guess what kind of viewing we had that night. But uh, we, did, we did get some good viewing out there and, and I wanna thank Mauricio for organizing several trips out there. I understand they still have not put the parking lot lights in. So Bar Street is still an option. Okay, go ahead. And then this was, I, I did a presentation a while back about how uh, remote areas make for um, good stargazing. And I spoke about scuba diving and then working wildland fires. And this was a fire uh, from last year. We were based at a ski resort and the funky looking building is part of the ski resort. And with my cell phone, I got a, Little picture of uh, a couple of the planets there with just a cell phone. So you don't have to have a fancy rig. Okay, I think that's it. All right, thank you, Elaine. Yes, excellent. Quite the traveler on your expeditions on that, um, on all these wonderful pictures, excellent. Uh, the next image I believe goes to Barbara Harris. I don't, 
Yes, she is here. Okay, good. So Barbara, uh, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk. Do you want to uh, mention a little bit about this image here? Yes, um, this is an image of the zodiacal light, which is a pyramid shaped area of light uh, with the base on the horizon and the apex uh, pointing towards the ecliptic. The zodiacal light is sunlight reflected off of dust in the solar system. Uh, and it's best seen when there's a uh, steep angle between the ecliptic and the horizon, which is around the time of the equinoxes. So in the springtime, it can be seen uh, about uh, a half hour after sunlight, uh, after sunset, astronomical um, twilight, uh, half an hour uh, after astronomical twilight in the West. And this was taken in the morning on September 7th, uh, where the zodiacal light is best seen a half an hour before astronomical uh, twilight uh, begins. Uh, so this is the first time I've taken an image of the uh, zodiacal light. And you could see uh, the beehive cluster uh, just to a little bit off center of uh, the, the, the correct that area. That's uh, the beehive. And you have to be in a dark area to see it, uh, no moonlight. Um, so uh, sometime this month is a good time to try to catch it if you're up early and um, in a dark location. All right, fantastic, great. Yes, it's, it's definitely an amazing thing to, uh, to see, especially this time of year, all the way through the, uh, the winter and early spring. So definitely get out to a dark place and take a look at that. All right, this is a couple, about a month ago, I got a chance to go out to Bull Creek and uh, photograph this. This is the, obviously the Milky Way. Uh, we had some fireflies. Um, this is on the Florida Trail um uh, over in the bull creek wildlife management area um so just a nice uh nice shot of the milky way um and i just wanted to get that really nice straight up and down uh look of the milky way itself so again actually to be quite honest with you this is i think one of the better spots for photographing the milky way than uh, kissimmee prairie because the light pollution towards the south is not as intense as it is down at Kissimmee Prairie. So um, we're hoping to do some more uh, CFIS events at this location. Um, so if you need another uh, reason to justify yourself to go out there, um, this, is, this is definitely it. So um, this was taken with a 60 camera with a uh, 24 millimeter at F4, ISO 1600, and two images, one of a sky tracked image of the Milky Way and one with untracked, and then it was, uh, blended together using a, a couple of interesting methods. And that's actually something that at, at one point, if anyone is interested in how to do this kind of stuff, I'd be happy to present a program on how to do blended uh, star tracked uh, images to get kind of, a, again, a very realistic uh, view of the sky. All right, uh, our next image, I believe is Andy's image. Um, and it doesn't look like he, again, yes, it doesn't look like he's here tonight. Um, but uh, this was taken with his refractor um, and, a, um, and a DSLR camera. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have all the notes on, on top of my head right now for this, but that's definitely a wonderful image of the moon that he took um, during one of his uh, imaging sessions. All right, the next image uh, belongs to Frank Kane. Frank, you want to talk about this? Yeah, this one's the Helix Nebula, which is a planetary nebula, which has nothing to do with planets, despite the name. Uh, this is actually formed by a sun very similar to our own that uh, ran out of fuel and blew off its outer shells of gas to create this beautiful planetary nebula. And at the very center of it, you can see the star itself that caused all this trouble, which is in the process of collapsing to a white dwarf. So this is the first uh, photo with my new camera that I'm very happy with, the uh, ZWO ASI 2600mm Pro. Uh, with a matching set of filters, filter wheel, and off-axis guider, all in the Skywatcher 190MN telescope on a Paramount Mighty Mount. And this represents, uh, I forget, I think it's like 11 hours of exposure time, if I remember right. 
All right. Um, excellent. Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely, I know that uh, Frank, you are aspiring to, I feel like a lot of times when you do your images, you are trying to recreate the Hubble aesthetic. And I definitely think the Helix Nebula, what you did to this uh, really captures that, captures that. And I think it honestly looks better than what Hubble captured. So great job, Frank. Excellent. All right, next one goes, I believe this is Fritz's image. Uh, Fritz, you are here tonight. So if you um, would like to talk about this, you are allowed to talk now. All right, yep, got a couple of wide field images here. Um, this one, of course, uh, the big, beautiful Veil Nebula. Um, and this is imaged in uh, HA and O3 using the HOO palette. Um, about 21 hours total of uh, integration time here. And then one of the things I definitely love most about, uh, you know, doing wide field, because this is with uh, my Red Cat 51, which is just 250 millimeter focal length, is just how forgiving the uh, tracking can be. So this is actually all uh, 30 minute exposures, all the subs. Um, and then of course too, I don't really like how uh, the star colors come out um, with the HOO palette. So uh, impose some RGB stars on there with some shorter uh, data. But I think it came out pretty good. It took me a long time to tweak the color to be uh, a little more appealing. Um, I think I'd like to go back and eventually do uh, just a regular old LRGB um, and then maybe add a little bit of AJ in there and that could be fun. Yes, of course. Uh, and of course, what uh... Fritz is talking about is L means luminance, uh, RGB, red, green, blue, and you combine all that to get a colored images, image using a, uh, it's called a monochromatic uh, camera for those that are used to astrophotography. So um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I still think it looks fantastic and, um, and Thank you. Uh, definitely worth the 21 hours of exposure <laughs> time. It's definitely, people don't realize the amount of time it takes just to capture one image. So. And then Fritz, I think the next one is also yours as well. So yep, um, yep. Uh, moving on here to uh, another Red Cat 51 image here um, from completed this one about a month ago uh, with the kind of the Lagoon Nebula complex here, really beautiful area. I'd never been able to do a wide field image of it. Um, and of course in Florida, when this is really at its prime, weather is uh, questionable. But I was able to get, in this case, about nine hours of data. And this is in, uh, like Derek was just explaining, LRGB, um, all at five minute subframes. And then I did also add in uh, hydrogen, hydrogen alpha, um, also just at five minute subframes, just to really make the red pop and bring out um, a lot of the uh, kind of background nebulosity that my luminance doesn't pick up super well, just because of my um, kind of light polluted skies out here in the Moss Park area. Uh, but I was really happy how this one turned out. I definitely love this area. This is, it's just really pretty part of the sky. Um, you don't see a lot of, you know, nice red and blue nebula kind of like this, um, I guess is common at least in, in terms of imaging like this. And um, yeah, just thought this was a pretty area of the sky. Absolutely, yes. It's of course uh, quite challenging to get uh, here in Florida because of the um, hum humid skies and just un <laughs> unforgiving weather, as you mentioned, Fritz. But uh, yeah, great, uh, great work on that. Uh, thank you so much for you. sharing your images. All right, let's move on to our next image. This is also from Andy. Um, and uh, again, uh, Andy, uh, this is, of course, the Andromeda Galaxy or M31. Um, well, technically M110 and M32. Uh, little neighboring galaxies uh, with it. Nice wide field image of the galaxy. Um, again, not too much information about this um, that I can recollect right now. I should have uh, kept the notes here, but uh, this was kind of a last minute submission. Actually, let me see if I can pull it up here. There we go. I did finally get it. So it looks like he took this with a William Optics GT81 with a ZWO ASI 2600 uh, pro camera uh, EQ6 pro uh, mount um, and uh, third, 25 uh, times 300 or six minutes uh, subframes 
um, for each filter processed um, in PixInsight. So uh, great, uh, great job, Andy, on those images of the Andromeda Galaxy. And I believe that is it. So um, again, thank you all for this. Um, um, and uh, hopefully get the chance to get out and do some astrophotography. Uh, if anyone has any has an, a spare laptop, uh, let me know because I'm still waiting on my laptop to be come back so I can do my own astrophotography. My previous one uh, decided to uh, fail on me. So I'm now waiting for a new one. And uh, you know how that goes. And hopefully yes. everybody's gotten their equipment by now to start doing some amazing astrophotography. Just for... three words, Derek, supply chain issues. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh... It's going to be, I think I predict a lot of gift cards for Christmas uh, in the near future. I, uh, some of my friends in the vendor community, it's like, it's going to be 18 months before they get any more of X such and such in. So it, it's going to be, uh, that means we should have really great weather because nobody can buy anything that would, that, right? If, if that's how that works. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, uh, Derek, uh, very much. And for the members uh, sending in their images, as you can see, we have quite a few uh, very talented uh, astrophotographers in the group of all skill levels. Uh, back before the pandemic, in the in the before days, you know, we used to do workshops and things on a somewhat regular basis, and um, we will get back to that uh, sometime in the in the near future. So our next uh, mini program tonight is John Pinto, who's going to talk about where is it? I predict there's probably math involved, uh, but I don't think he's going to give us a quiz at the end. Take it away, John. Thanks, Richard. All right, let me get a set up here. All righty, and let me get my self set up here. Here we go. And one more thing. Uh, okay. All right, so the last time I did a program in July, it was called What Time Is It? Now, um, the follow-up to that is once you know what time it is, you're going to want to know, well, okay, where is it in the sky when it is that time that I've calculated? Let's see how we can do that. So I'm going to start with the celestial sphere. All right, that's you in your yard, looking up at the sky, taking a look at Orion. And the stars will follow this arcing path in your sky. Okay, now I'm going to assume you're here in Florida. So when you look directly south, from the North Pole all the way down, or the celestial North Pole, following it south, to the celestial south pole, that's called your central meridian. So all of our calculations somehow are related to the time, which has to do with the location of the central meridian and how far you are past or before your star time or sidereal time, a technical term. So <clears throat> there's many ways to do this. I am going to not do it the same way that I did in July, though you, you still can do that, um, to calculate your star time, because you kind of have to start there. Uh, but in this particular uh, program, I'm going to show a couple of other shortcuts that you can use uh, to get that star time, uh, which is one of the ingredients to calculating where something is in the sky. Um, <clears throat> you are, we are going to do some spherical trigonometry. Don't get scared. It just means you have to press some buttons on the calculator. Um, so you don't really have to know how they're derived. They're not going to do all of that. Uh, but I will show you the formulas that you plug into your calculator and it will come out and tell you what direction 
whatever celestial object we're calculating. So, you know, north, east, south, west, and how high it is above the sky, how many degrees above the sky in that direction. So that's where we're, we're gonna be going. We're going for altitude or the height and direction, which is measured in degrees starting with the north is zero, east is 90, south is 180, west is 270. So if you get your compass out, whether it's a physical one or the one in your, in your cell phone and you point it, it will tell you one of those degrees. So let's get going. All right, so what are the steps that we need to do? All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we have to gather some data and get out a calculator. We will calculate your local star time. And for this program, I'm gonna use some shortcuts, but again, you wanna go back to the full calculation back in July, look at that uh, uh, YouTube video or, or pull up the PDF that I stored up on our Facebook page or groups IO page. We're then gonna calculate something called the local hour angle. And this is kind of the critical step uh, before you can put all these numbers into a calculator and, and get out your altitude and direction. So I'm gonna talk about the local hour angle a few times, but let's just get uh, the preliminaries out of the way here. The local hour angle is defined to be the time in degrees, which is 15 degrees per hour, since that object has passed your central meridian that we just spoke about. Now, I don't expect you to really understand that if you've never heard of local hour angle before, that's fine. It's just a number we have to calculate uh, in order to plug it into our formulas. And of course, we're gonna calculate the altitude and the direction. And as usual, I will try to simplify this as much as possible by assuming we're observing here in Florida. And when we're done, our accuracy should be about plus or minus one degree. So pretty, pretty accurate. So what do we need to start with? Well, you're obviously gonna to need to know what date and time you planned on observing whatever it is you wanna observe. You'll need to know where you are. So you'll need your latitude and longitude. You'll need the coordinates of whatever celestial object you're interested in, which basically means you need to find out its right ascension and its declination. So, what are we gonna use for our example? I'm actually gonna do two observations, one in the evening and one in the morning. For our location, we're gonna use the uh, patio at Seminole State College where we do a lot of our outreach events. So that was a nice central location. It might be something that you would actually possibly do. So that happens to be the latitude and longitude of that location. And we're gonna look on Sunday evening, October 24th at 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And we're gonna to try to see where Myra is in the sky. It's one of the famous variable stars. I've been following it since July. And I thought it'd be nice to find out where it would be on that particular evening. I also picked that evening because uh, the moon won't be in the way. Um, so I looked up Myra and I found out it's right ascension and it's declination. You'll notice the declination is negative. That's a common um, way to represent uh, declinations that are in the south or below the uh, celestial equator. The other one will be the following morning, Monday, October 25th at 7 a.m. And that is the day that Mercury is farthest from the sun. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to figure out, well, where is Mercury actually going to be in the sky. So again, looked it up, and that is uh, Mercury's right ascension and declination on that morning. So where would you get this data? So obviously you can use Google Maps or a paper map to determine the latitude and longitude of your observing location, or you can take out your cell phone if it's got a GPS in it and it will tell you. You can use a star catalog or an atlas uh, or search the internet to get the right ascension and declination of the celestial objects, except for planets. Planets are special, we'll talk about that in a second. 
Now for planets, you will need some form of an almanac for the year that you are observing. Since the planets and the moon change their position every day, every minute, every hour. Um, some sources of that information could be the uh, US Naval Observatory's Astronomical Almanac, which has pretty much everything you would ever need for the year. You can use the US Naval Observatory's Nautical Almanac that also has pretty much everything you need except for Mercury. It does not include information for Mercury. And finally, the uh, Royal Observatory of, of uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Observer's Handbook that we we're having a special on also has everything that you need except for the moon. Uh, so got lots of places you can get uh, all of this information that you need. Um, all of those almanacs and handbooks will have right ascension and declination of other celestial objects, such as stars and uh, clusters and galaxies, etc. besides planets. So you may not need anything besides just the almanacs. So I got some images in case you've never seen these. So this is the nautical almanac, this is the astronomical almanac, and this is the observer's handbook for this year. And I took some pictures of some star catalogs. Some of you may have one of these. I know I've had these for many, many, many years. And the next thing that we're going to do that's a little different than my previous um, talks is we're going to use a calculator, specifically the Casio calculator. Now, uh, I got turned on to this by um, another um, hobby that I'm involved in, and it uses a lot, a lot of degrees and minutes and seconds and hours and minutes and seconds calculations. And I found this calculator to be excellent um, tool to really speed up the work. And one of the things that really speeds it up is this tiny little button here. Looks like a degree sign, a minute sign, and a second sign that comes in really handy for converting between hours and degrees and decimal degrees and decimal hours, as we'll see uh, in some of the future slides. So I need to do a little digression here uh, because uh, this is gonna be really important for any type of astronomical calculation you're gonna do. You need to understand there is an equivalence between hours and degrees in astronomy. So when we measure star time or, or sidereal time or location in the sky or directions in the sky, it is sometimes convenient to use hours and sometimes it's convenient to use degrees. They are equivalent once you know how to convert one into the other. 360 degrees equals 24 hours. So the formulas we're gonna end up using are things like uh, if I have degrees and I need to turn it into hours, I take the degrees and divide it by 15. Or if I have hours and I need to turn them into degrees, I multiply the hours by 15. In both cases, if you also have minutes and seconds you have to deal with, you need to convert those into a decimal, which typically means taking the minutes, dividing by 60, taking the seconds and dividing it by 3,600. But you don't have to know any of that because if you're using that calculator, that little Casio calculator, pressing that button does all of those uh, decimal conversions for you. You still have to do the do dividing, multiplying by 15, but that's, that's very straightforward. Okay, digression is over. So let's calculate our local star time. Now, again, like I said, we could do the full calculation like we did in July. For this talk, I'm going to show you two shortcuts using the Nautical Almanac or the Observer's Handbook. Um, the page on the left comes from that Nautical Almanac, and the page on the right comes from the Observer's Handbook. I'm going to calculate star time uh, using the Nautical Almanac, that's on the left, for the calculation for Myra, and I'm going to use the Observer's Handbook on the right to calculate the star time when we want to observe Mercury. So you get a chance to kind of see how you do it both ways. All right, how do we do it from the nautical almanac? 
Well, the first thing you need to do is take the time of your observation and convert it to UTC. Remember, we're here in Florida. So if we're in standard time, we have to add five hours to get UTC. And if we're in daylight savings time, we have to add four hours. So on my slide a few pages back where I said, we we're gonna look at Myra on October 24th in the evening at 9 p.m. We have to add four hours to that. And it turns out that that is October 25th at 1 a.m. So next you look up the GHA of Aries. Don't worry what that means. It's just the title of the column in the Nautical Almanac for October 25th at 1 a.m. UTC. So if we go back a couple of slides, you'll see October 25th at 01 hours UTC, it's 48 degrees, 38.6 minutes. Okay, so let's go back. There's a 48 degrees, 38.6 minutes. Now, if you're not observing exactly at 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, but a couple minutes later, uh, what you have to do is for every four minutes that you are past the hour, you have to add one degree to this value. Okay, but we're going to go simple here and just do exactly at nine o'clock. The next thing you do is you take the number of degrees and you subtract your longitude. And again, this is for Florida. So that was the location, the longitude location of the patio. We subtract it from our GHA of Aries and we get negative 32.6609, degrees. Well, you can't really do that, can't use that. You need a positive number. So we all know 360 degrees uh, makes one full circle. So to get a positive number, we add 360 degrees. And we finally end up with a star time in degrees of 327.3390271 degrees. Okay. And just as an aside, if you happen to be in an Eastern longitude, say you're in Italy and you wanna get your local start time, instead of subtracting your longitude, you'll be adding your longitude. It's really the only difference. Uh, the other difference would be um, if you're adding uh, your longitude, it could come higher, it could become greater than 360. So you would have to subtract 360 to get the value to fall between zero and 360 degrees. Of course, using a calculator makes these kind of calculations a breeze. Okay, back to local hour angle. All right, so before we calculate local hour angle, we need to convert the right ascension of our object into hours uh, to degrees, which was, if you remember back on that original slide, we have to just multiply by 15. And again, just as a reminder, the local hour angle is the amount of star time in degrees that has passed since the celestial object has crossed your central meridian. Its definition is your star time minus your right ascension. Okay, and that's the reason why we have to convert everything into degrees. So let's take Myra. When we had looked it up in our almanac or in our star catalog, it told us that it's at Right ascension is two hours, 20 minutes, and 25.9 seconds. Using that Casio calculator and pressing that degree button, that turns out to be this number of decimal hours. Multiplying by 15 degrees per hour, comes out that Myra is at 35.10791667 degrees. That's its right ascension. So now we can calculate our LHA. So we take our local start time, we just calculated from the nautical almanac. We subtract out the right ascension of Myra, and we find out that the LHA is 292 degrees, 0 0.2311104 degrees. And if the LHA for some reason had come out negative, we just need to add 360 to make it positive. Okay. I will say one thing again, just as an aside, if you happen to be in the southern hemisphere, say you're in Chile and visiting the Atacama Desert, um, your central meridian uh, will run from 
uh, again, from the north to the South Pole, but the difference will be typically you'll be facing north. Um, just like here in Florida, we typically face south along the central meridian. But again, using the calculator made all of these calculations really simple. All right, we are now ready to calculate altitude. We have all the data that we need. And we're going to make use of the memories in the calculator because it makes this super simple. And we're gonna be able to reuse our calculation when we go to do Mercury very, very easily. So the first thing you wanna do is store your latitude in uh, your A memory. Again, if you were uh, uh, in a Southern latitude, it would be negative, but we're in Florida, so everything's positive. The declination of our object, again, uh, we had pulled that out of the almanac and, or the star catalog and uh, we saw that it was a southern declination, so it was negative. But if the declination is positive, if it's north, you, you leave it as a positive number. And finally, we're going to load the uh, LHA in memory C. And that was the calculation we just did. Finally, we are going to enter the altitude formula into our calculator. And that is what it looks like. Now, it turns out in that Casio calculator, you can actually type it in just like this. It'll look exactly like this. And if you do that and you press the equal sign, you get that the altitude of Myra at that time is going to be 17.88751391 degrees. Obviously, you're not going to be able to uh, measure it that accurately, but 17 degrees approximately 18 degrees, you're going to be able to use uh, an estimate of where that is uh, height in the sky. Then what you're going to want to do is store that altitude in memory location D, because right? we're going to reuse that in the next calculation for direction. All right, so in order to calculate direction, we first have to calculate an intermediate value. I'm just going to call A. That's just the traditional uh notation for it it doesn't mean memory location a sorry for the abuse of notation but it's just what it's always been called so again you can type this into your calculator just like this especially if you use that casio calculator so it's going to use those memory locations we just loaded into and you'll see d was our altitude we had just calculated and again press that equal button and it turns out that your A is 103.7225416 degrees. So we now just need to turn A into direction, which is a very simple formula. If the LHA was greater than 180, then the direction is the same as A. But if it was less than 180, the direction would be 360 minus A. Straight, straightforward. In our case, with Myra, the LHA was greater than 180, so our direction is 103.722, 5416 degrees. Now, again, you're probably not going to be able to measure your direction that accurately, but 104 degrees, you get your compass out, and you see you know, where that is in the sky, you go up 18 degrees, and you'll hopefully you'll find Myra. Okay. Mercury is going to be a lot quicker because I'm not going to go through all of that. We're just going to quite quickly go through it. The only thing I'm going to talk a little bit more about is how would we do calculate the local star time using the observer's handbook. Okay. So again, we have to do our uh, UTC calculation by adding four hours to our time, which was going to be 7 a.m. <clears throat> Eastern Daylight Savings Time, but adding four hours, you get 11 a.m. According to the handbook, to get your local star time, you need to get the Greenwich, England star time for the month, and then you adjust it for your date, time, and longitude. So there we go. So in the handbook, if I skip back a bunch of screens, you would have found that in October, the GST or Greenwich, England star time is 0 0.5977 hours. So you gotta start there. You have to look that up. That changes year to year. You then do this formula, which is 
0 0.5977, which is the number we just found. You multiply the number of days in the month by this number, 0 0.06571. And then you multiply the time, decimal hours, by 1.002738. These two numbers are constant, though I would check the handbook every year because they might vary slightly, possibly. But the starting sidereal time for the month is the thing that really changes from year to year and from month to month, of course. So plopping in our numbers on the 25th, 11th hour. The reason we're multiplying by 15 is because these are hours and we need it in degrees. So remember our original formula, multiply by 15 to get the degrees out of the hour, hours. And it comes out to 199.05852 degrees. To get your local star time, you just subtract your longitude again. Again, we're in Florida. And if we had been in, e in the Eastern uh, longitude, we would have had, had to add that longitude. But again, stick to Florida, subtract it out. And we get that our start time for viewing Mercury that morning will be 117.7542138 degrees. All right. Let's just do it quickly, LHA, then altitude and direction. So a latitude hasn't changed and it's already been a, a, in stored in A, so we don't have to touch that. Declination, we had looked it up in the almanac and it said it was minus three degrees. 39 minutes, 43.7 seconds. And Mercury's RA was as we just uh, calculated, I'm sorry, we looked it up and we multiplied it by 15 degrees and we uh, got 193.629625 degrees. Now we do the LHJ, which is our LST minus our right ascension, possibly adding 360 if necessary and store that in C. So we do the calculation real quick, 117 from the uh, start time we just calculated minus 193, which was the RA we just calculated, add 360 if necessary, and we get at the LHA for Mercury on that morning is 284.1245888 degrees. Nice thing about this calculator is you can actually rerun formulas if you have everything stored in memory. So you just scroll up to the altitude formula again, press the equal sign, and it calculates out your altitude. And we're gonna store that in D like we had done with Myra. Again, we scroll up on the calculator to the direction formula we had done before with everything stored in memory and we get an A of 100 degrees. And again, since our LHA was greater than 180, the direction equals A. All right, so answer to our question, where is it? So Myra on Sunday, October 24th at 9 p.m., altitude is about 18 degrees and direction is about 104 degrees. Mercury, on the following morning, October 25th at 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the altitude is about 10 and a half degrees and the direction will be about 100 degrees. So now you have all the information you need at the end of the month to go out and try to observe Myra and Mercury at those times. Hopefully our calculations were correct and you will find these things in the sky at those locations. If you are really interested in going deeper in uh, these type of calculations, I highly recommend the books uh, that you've seen me show you in previous mini programs. You can pull up the video or the PDFs of those um, to get more information on those. And as always, I will upload this presentation to our Facebook page and to Groups.io uh, so that you can review it again. And of course, you can always rewatch the video uh, uh, after it's posted. And thank you all for listening and uh, for your attention. Thanks, John, our new board member at large. Okay, so next is me. Um, I have the shortest mini program of all of them. As soon as I click all the right buttons. Hello.
Peter is a hard act to follow uh, after his excellent presentation, but I will try. A minute on the moon. The Bay of Rainbows, also known by the Hogwarts astronomers as Sinus Iridium, is in the northwestern part of the moon as a bay off of the much larger Sea of Showers or Mare Imbrium. This plain of basaltic lava here is about 155 miles across. This image was taken months ago, but it is the approximate lighting you'll have on this area on the evening of October 18th, this particular, uh, this month. Uh, on this particular night, the lunar is, um, the lunar limb is rocking, uh, I'm sorry, part of my thing was over covered up. Anyway, the libration is rocking the moon back and forth a little bit. And uh, the craters were putting on an amazing light show along the terrain extending towards the limb. Uh, here you can see Harpalus Crater about 25 miles wide and two miles deep. And you can easily see here the details on the far terraced wall of the crater greeting the rising sun and some small ridges Hang on a second, I am having computer issues. All right, there we are. Um, things keep popping up on my screen. We need like a leave me on the low mode when you're doing a presentation, right? Uh, so you can easily see here details uh, on the far terrace walls, the crater greeting the rising sun and some small ridges uh, that extend up around the center. But have a look at this though, with my, my best Steve Irwin uh, impersonation. Have a look at this. Uh, this large outer crater is Babbage, 90 miles wide, and this little guy here in the middle is Babbage A, much smaller, only about 20 miles wide. Babbage A's rim is lit up like a glowing white hot ring, and it's casting a shadow. Let me get my mouse pointer. This here is the shadow of Babbage A casting across the crater floor and onto the far wall of the crater. The moon is different every hour of the day. Uh, or night, and even the smallest telescope is your personal spacecraft that will take you to the moon on any clear night, and often during the day too. So what are you waiting for? There is no need to wait for SpaceX or uh, Amazon to get you there. It's a lot more affordable uh, as well. So thanks for letting me spend a minute on the moon tonight, even if it may have taken a minute and a half this time. And that's it. Next up, uh, I'm looking very uh, forward to this talk by Bill Castro on texting, uh, sketching. I really can't talk. I'm, I'm going to stay muted. Oh, you, you're doing all right there. Hopefully you can hear me uh, share my screen. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. I guess I should hang around long enough to help you transition. And I just got a saw a thing. Bill Castro is sharing his screen. And I see your screen. And I see your PowerPoint in PowerPoint. Uh, what, um... Ha, it's not just me tonight. Excellent. Yeah, something looks different. I'm not sure what, uh, <laughs> what I did. Well, there it's it's coming up fine now, so you're good to go. Uh, okay, uh, for um, according to Wikipedia, and computing WYSIWYG is an acronym for uh, what you see is what you get. It is a system in which editing software allows content to be edited in a form that resembles its appearance when printed or displayed as a finished product. And this is what you want in astronomical sketching. What you see in the eyepiece is what you want to get on the paper. So here's what I'll be covering. Uh, most of my techniques come, oops, let me, uh, there, yeah, I'm having troubles with my computer too, I guess. And uh, most of my techniques though come from the book shown on the right. And I should also note that I'll be just discussing sketching with pencils only. The book also discusses using charcoal, pastels, and ink. So for visual observers, sketching what you see at the eyepiece helps you in many ways. You know, it improves your observing skills, works hand in hand with your observing logs, helps you remember details. You, know, you review your sketch and notes when you're going to observe this object at a later date. And it's easy to do. You know, I am not an artist by any stretch of the imagination, 
my drawing skills are drafting skills and a drafting machine that goes way back. And I think it was an intern, my first uh, summer job in college. And uh, you know you're really old when you see your drafting machine at the Smithsonian. So uh, for those of you who don't know what a drafting machine is, I got one here, a uh, picture on the right from Wikipedia. It's, it's old school there. So here are some basic tools to start out with. I'll need some kind of red flashlight. I use the one here. It mounts on my head, it's motion activated. I wave my hand in front of it to turn it on and wave my hand in front of it again to turn it off. Now it comes from the factory quite bright. So I dim it down by taping a brown paper bag over it. Either a headlamp like this or something clamped to the clipboard will keep your hands free to hold the pencil on the clipboard when sketching. And you can take your pick of what kind of paper you want to use. I use paper for my printer. Uh, we can start out with a standard number two pencil. And the clipboard on the right has an elastic band that can hold pencils in place. It's shown here in the front for clarity, but the elastic band and the pencils go on the back uh, when you're in use. Then a pencil sharpener is nice to take along with you in case you break the tip of the pencil. So here are some more tools if you want to take it to the next level. Uh, the eraser shield up in the upper left helps with minor touch-ups without removing too much. I use these three pencils the most. The 2B is the darkest of the three. HB is a standard number two pencil. It's a medium dark shade. 2H is the lightest of these three. The different number shades are shown on the far left and right sides. And I got that from the URL down at the bottom. The kneaded eraser, which is right here, that's a neat little thing that you use that to dab your drawing slightly to remove a little bit of graphite and lighten it up. Then the pink pearl eraser and the eraser at the end of the pencils are for major erasing. Then that brush is for brushing off eraser residue without smearing your sketch. <coughs> Excuse me. The blending stump is used for smoothing out the graphite and nebular galaxy sketches. And the sandpaper block keeps the blending stump clean for next time. Last but not least, I have a storage box to keep it all in. The circle templates help with making small round stars and larger circles are used for the drawing area. You can also use them to make planet templates. And most importantly is that observing chair. That makes it easy to sit at the eyepiece when you're sketching. Now I started out with simple sketches right in my observing notebook. I didn't bother drawing the entire eyepiece field of view or even the entire planet. Just the important details I wanted to remember. I also noted in text the details I was highlighting. Both sketch and notes help you remember these details later. Here I'm noting the great red spot, some interesting white lines in the cloud belts. Here are some other examples of simple sketches in my observing notebook. Now it's natural to connect the dots to see a picture of something you're familiar with. That's a great way to remember detail. On the upper right, I note open cluster CR70 and it looked to me like a golf club with a bright star and a golf ball in the middle. So, so I just drew the stick figure of what the chain of stars really looked like to me, the, the brighter ones. For NGC 2281, that's in the lower left, <clears throat> I drew the overall shape of the chain of stars. And that's the overall shape there. It looked like the St. Louis arch and then with the cursive letter I in the middle. And then I, next to that, I drew the individual stars. And I also noted a couple of double stars within it. So next time I look at that object, I know to pay attention to that double star detail there and there, it's kind of neat. For asterism French one, I drew the individual stars and then connected the dots to highlight that toadstool shape. 
So for more detailed sketches, <clears throat> I use the techniques and tools noted in the book and other reference material that will be shown at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> the CFIS observing log file, it's available on the group's IO pages, shown here on the, on the right. The Astronomical League has templates also and, and observing logs. Now I added the clock dial for reference. The, the numbers 12, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in those positions. I Googled <clears throat> clock dial face. I scaled it to the same circle size as the observing log. And I just put the paper over the monitor and, and traced in the uh, numbers onto the log. Now remember the center dot. So all of that helps you position the location of stars relative to each other. <clears throat> so most of what you draw have a star field involved. When you're drawing star fields, think of geometric shapes like triangles, squares, and so on. You wanna position them with regards to the center dot and the outer clock dial numbers as shown here with the imaginary blue lines. I like to start out with the lighter 2H pencil. It's easier to erase if you have to reposition the star. And I plot the bright framework of stars, starting at the outer edge, and work my way inward. When I'm happy with those positions, I then make them darker with the HB pencil. I then plot the fainter stars and fill in the rest of the view there. Finally, I check the darkness of the stars and their size. The brighter stars I make darker and bigger with the 2B pencil. Medium bright stars are slightly smaller and fainter with the HB pencil. And the fainter stars stay small and faint with the 2H pencil. So that's just one way of doing it though. You'll need to experiment to see what works best for you. And in this example, I was checking out my star placement with a, with a CCD image of the same object. It's Kimball's Cascade and the open cluster NGC 1502. You can see the details on the left of uh, what my uh, friend in Ohio, uh, he took that picture there. Um, see Kimball's Cascade, there's bright stars slowing down. <clears throat> and that's the open cluster down here. And then on the right, you see my sketch here. And then I switched eyepieces on another night and, and drew the uh, higher magnification view of the open cluster. So I was pretty happy with how that turned out. It's always good to check your work like that. So here on the left is an example of the original sketch of the eyepiece. It's one of my favorite areas of the sky. You know, it's the start of Nebula Road, Sagittarius going on up. But uh, in this view from top to bottom is the open cluster M21. That's the Trifid Nebula M20. And then in the lower right here, the, in the eyepiece field of view is uh, Lagoon Nebula M8. Now I took a cell phone picture of the sketch and then I made a negative of the sketch area in Microsoft Paint. And what I did is, you know, you select the area that you want to make a negative of, you right mouse button click in that area. And then a little uh, menu comes up and you want to select invert colors. And this is Microsoft Paint, not Microsoft 3D, or not Microsoft Paint 3D. So after you've done that, you save it, then you can adjust the sharpness on contrast in your uh, Microsoft photo editor or any other editor you have. <clears throat> so the reference material goes into detail on how to draw various planetary features, and there's a lot of details on how to draw those features. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn templates are available at the reference links. I'll show you later. Uh, here's examples of some. The Jupiter one, it's, these lines on the side are a useful uh, starting point to keep the belts in per perspective. You know, this width is about right for one of the equatorial belt belts. This one's a good one for the other equatorial belt. There's the equator, so forth and so on. Then there's also the templates for Saturn with the rings tilted at different angles. 
I like using these templates because it's not always easy to draw good circles and ovals at night. <clears throat> For um, lunar craters, it's best to pick sun at least five degrees from the terminator. That way the shadows won't change the view too fast. And the reference material tells you important techniques on how to sketch these. On the right, I noted the December 2020 Jupiter and Saturn conjunction over three different days. Now, you know, it doesn't have to be the greatest sketch of the planet or whatever. But the key thing to note is their relative positions with respect to each other and that background star right there. <clears throat> it's a great illustration of planetary motion. From top to bottom, the dates are Saturday the 19th, Monday the 21st, and Tuesday the 22nd. <clears throat> so it's interesting to see the movement relative to that reference star there. <coughs> excuse me, there, and then again down here. See Jupiter's quickly passing Saturn, and then Saturn's taking longer to pull away. <coughs> oh, excuse me, allergies are getting me. So to take it to a level even higher, you can join Alpo and submit some sketches. It isn't too far of a reach to turn our Cephas observing log, shown on the left, to an Alpo observing log, which is shown on the right. Alpo still needs visual observations to get 24 hour coverage of the planets. They offer training to improve your observing skills to note the fine details that most of us would miss. So uh, I think the book is a must have. I really like the book. Here are the sections it covers on how to draw. And it also discusses tools, techniques, pencils, papers, ink, pastels, and charcoals. And then the Astronomical League Sketching Award is a good way to improve your skills. I did this in about a year in my suburban backyard. And uh, there's a YouTube video there. There's the link. That's a, that's a pretty good one as well. Uh, and the league sketching resource page is shown. In, I'll show you on the next slide here. And uh, there's a screenshot of it. If you can't get the book, at least see that YouTube video on the previous slide. And these videos highlighted here, here, this series there, that. That covers a lot of it. And then the other templates, uh, links here are good for uh, information and, and templates and whatnot. There's also information in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Observing Handbook. And there's a paragraph or two on each of these topics I've got listed there. It's about uh, three pages worth of information. So in summary, this is, you know, start out simple, you know, experiment, see what works for you. Use templates and have fun. You know, it's up to you to make it as simple, as detailed as you want. And if you have any questions, you can get a hold of me through the group's IO page or my email here. Okay, that's all I've got. Thanks, Bill. I was gonna mention if you didn't, that you had just received the sketching uh, certificate. We presented that virtually at the last uh, club meeting, and then I saw you uh, this weekend at the star party and was able to give you the certificate of the pin in person. So pretty cool. I have that sketching book. Uh, there's also a corresponding book on that focuses specifically on uh, sketching the moon. Uh, I think it's in the same series. Um, got them both on Kindle. There's also, and I can't post a link about it, but there are several sketchers on Twitter uh, that I follow and they post their astronomical sketches, just like a lot of us post our uh, astronomical photos and um, a couple of them even do videos and they'll post the videos of their 
uh, of their sketching process. Pretty cool. So thanks again, Bill. And uh, it brings us to our last mini program. Um, don't think I've missed anybody. Yep, several minutes on the sun by Eric Coyne. Eric? Yes, yes, I think, you can hear the applause the last yeah. program. Right? Yeah, let me share my, get my screen shared here. Okay. Uh, oh, disabled. Ready? Host disabled participant screen sharing. Well, then we need to fix that. Let me see if I can find you here. Do, do, do. It is time to go. Change roll to, well, you are. Hmm. You are a panelist. Does anybody know? Oh, Eric Coyne is now a co host. Okay. That must have clicked the wrong button somewhere. Somebody took care of that. Thank you. Uh oh. Barbara, Try here's it. a lot of static. Try it again, Eric. Okay. I hope I'm not creating the static. I don't hear any static. Okay. Let's bring this up. I see your screen. There we go. A few there minutes go. fun. All right, we're live. Uh, otherwise known as this episode is called Corona Part One. And I say part one because I'm going to split this up into a couple presentations because there's just so much information about the uh, Corona that uh, I don't think one episode is going to cover it. So this is going to be more of an overview, especially visually. Uh, to see the Corona visually is just really exciting. Uh, see it to see it with your own eyes. Um, so if uh, I did a program on everything I want to cover with the Corona, Sun's Corona, it would uh, practically make a full program. Um, so the Sun's Corona, and we're not talking about the surface here. So if you look at uh, number six of my little uh, diagram here, illustration, you'll see that it's the uh, outermost part of the sun we're talking, more of an atmosphere here. Now the sun does have an atmosphere and the corona is the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere. Now the word corona is Latin. It comes from a word meaning garland, wreath, or crown. And we're really familiar with the C word, C virus that uh, from the pandemic and uh, the coronavirus. So if you're in the medical field at all, you know the structure and why it has its name, coronavirus. Um, so the corona actually um, runs at very high temperatures and um, it's, pretty tenuous and pretty delicate, but the temperatures are so high that um, it's referred to as a plasma. Now there's, and sometimes uh, plasma is referred to the, as the fourth state of matter along with liquids, gas, solids. And some examples of uh, plasma are lightning, aurora, the uh, low pressure gas and neon lights that you see, uh, plasma balls, and if you've got one, probably a lightsaber. I haven't been able to uh, uh, personally see a lightsaber, even though I imagine that would be the handiest lawn, landscaping tool to uh, trim hedges and edge the sidewalk and stuff like that. Um, but safety first. So the sun does have an atmosphere. Now the corona itself, it reaches really high temperatures, but it's very dim. Now if um, we could see the corona, then with a solar filter, we'd be seeing the corona all the time. I guess that's what makes uh, heading long distances in order to catch it such a thrill. Um, but why is the corona very dim? Well, although it's so many, so much hotter than the surface of the sun, which will run around 10,000 degrees, the corona is about 10 million times less dense than the sun's surface. Uh, and it's this low density that makes a corona 
that much less bright than the surface of the sun. Um, the corona itself will extend about 5 million miles into space. And it's the interaction. Well, like I said, this episode, I'm not going to get into the physics. We'll get into that more on the next episode because we're going to cover some other things that, um, about the solar wind. But it travels at speed so high it escapes the sun's gravity. We're talking around 400 kilometers per second or a million miles an hour. And if you've never witnessed that, I think I saw a minivan going that speed down I-4, uh, returning from Seminole State College the other day. Um, so one of the mysteries that's still being work, worked on and checked out is the coronal temperature compared to the surface of the sun. Well, NASA's got a mission called IRIS, the Inner face region spectrograph. And they've discovered some packets, pockets of very hot material called heat bombs that travel from the sun's surface into the corona. Now, the surface of the sun, as I said, varies, is about 10,000 degrees inside, uh, say, the center of a sunspot. It can be 7,500 uh, 7, degrees Fahrenheit, we're talking here. but uh, temperatures of the corona can go from 1.7 million to 17 million degrees. Incredible. And uh, some of the corona intera interacts with the uh, sun's magnetic field, which we covered on previous episodes. And so if you can uh, see them like in hydrogen alpha filter, you'll see the streamers, the loops, and the plumes that uh, that interaction creates. So how do you actually see the sun's corona? Well, you could use a corona graph. And one of them is called LASCO, or the Large Angle and Spectrometric Corona Graph. And it's part of the NASA European Space Agency, SOHO, which is the Solar and Helo Heliospheric Observatory spacecraft. And so here's an image that uh, I clipped. And the, you can see the date, so it's yesterday, at a, uh, 4.42 PM. And where's my cursor? So during the time of this um, observation, you can see some bright things. Now, the sun itself is in the constellation Virgo. So I think a couple things that you can see here, uh, Spica. Possibly, I'm saying that could be Mars. I'd have to check the star chart though, um, see how accurate my guess is. But of course you need something to hold the coronagraph. That's the uh, uh, image here that we see interplaying with the sky. Uh, you've got some uh, meteors coming through here. My guess is because of the length and the brightness, this could be an Orionid. It could be a sporadic, but the Orionids go from October 2nd through November 2nd. And uh, uh, if you replay this video, uh, double check it against the star chart. I guess I should have done that, but... Uh, uh, okay, so either you can use a coronagraph to try and see the corona, and you can see how far in this image it extends out, or you could view a total solar eclipse. Here is a breathtaking image um, created by Derek Demeter during the uh, total eclipse back on August 21st of 2017. And you can see all the streamers here. You've got some prominences sticking up out here, and this is just spectacular. Uh, so you need something in nature like the moon traveling in front of the sun to visually see the sun's corona and see it safely. Um, so you can see the, uh, it's just, uh, just stunning, just stunning. All right, let's move on. So I know we've got some eclipses coming up. And one is uh, in 20, let's see, April 8th, 2024, going across uh, our continent that a lot of folks are getting excited about and we'll be thrilled to see. But wait, 
There's more. Is Elaine coming on? I'm here. All right. So if you liked a few more, a few minutes with the sun, you're going to like a few more minutes with the sun. And I put question marks on there because this is entitled a few minutes with the sun. It's called a minute 54 seconds without the sun. Okay. I'm disabled uh -oh. for sharing. Richard, do your magic. Do, do, do. I didn't do it, but the magic has been wrought by someone else already. So try again, oh. Elaine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yay. Elaine Fisher has started sharing. There you go. Fabulous. Eric you out. You can't see my slideshow icon because it's under the let me banner at the top. Hang on. Let me uh let me close mine. Maybe that'll help. So we see Elaine's screen and I see PowerPoint. And we see it looks like you're on the last slide. Start from the beginning. Hope that works. There we go. Okay, well, Rip, um, Eric's been talking about the corona, and uh, several people tonight have talked about um, seeing solar eclipses. Eric's presentation is a few minutes with the sun, so I'm going to spend a minute and 54 seconds without the sun. Now, what does that mean? There's a total solar eclipse this year. Many people have talked about the one coming up in 2024. There is a solar total solar eclipse this year, but there's not much talk about it. So where can one see that total solar eclipse? Only one place, Antarctica. And I spoke about this briefly in a, in a previous presentation. Um, so that our Antarctica is a big continent. Where exactly will the total solar eclipse of December 4th, 2021 be visible? And this is a schematic of the primary path. Um, the Antarctic Peninsula, the part sticking out here, is what points to the tip of South America. And in this shot, you can see the tip of South America right there. And it shows the primary path of the total solar eclipse. This schematic shows where the um, greatest duration and most complete eclipse will be. And right here in the corner, it says duration, a minute and 54 seconds. That is the greatest duration. But for another viewpoint on where that spot is, there's your greatest duration. So it's inside the um, Antarctic Peninsula. But isn't there a problem with that? Because doesn't that normally look like this? Here is your Antarctic Peninsula. And what is all of this? Ice. And your greatest point uh, for viewing is right here. So how does one get a really good look at the 2021 solar eclipse when this is the spot? A lot of cruises are going down to view the eclipse and they're leaving from either Ushuaia, Argentina, or Punta Arenas, Chile. And they're coming down to the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. And they're gonna do a little touring around and they're gonna head out to the path of the eclipse for the viewing. But my previous slide showed the best viewing was down here off the bottom of the picture under where it says air travel. So how does one perhaps do that when it's full of ice and the ships aren't planning it? Remember, it's inside, this is called the Weddell Sea. So how do you do it? You find a cruise ship that's an icebreaker. This is Le Commandant Charcot. It is a French cruise ship. It's been in service less than six months. And it is the only polar class two cruise ship, which means it can do year round operation 
in um, modest multi-year ice conditions. This ship is rated for eight and a half feet of ice. And you can see in this picture, a little gangway coming down. Ship is completely surrounded by ice, but it's fine. And people can walk off the ship onto the ice to see the solar eclipse. So how does this icebreaker cruise ship compare to other cruise ships? Pretty much like any other cruise ship, this is not a working icebreaker. This is an icebreaker cruise ship. It has a helipad, but that is for scouting and emergencies. So they can send uh, some representatives out ahead to see where the ice is the thinnest. Um, but it also has two swimming pools, including this outdoor swimming pool, which is heated to 90 degrees. And I bring this up because I am going on this cruise. I am leaving at the end of November and we'll meet up with the ship in Punta Arenas, Chile. And we will be going down into the ice to the only place that will have uh, the long duration and the full um, obscuring of the sun by the moon. None of the other ships can even get close. So stay tuned, there will be more. I might be just a little jealous. Very nice. Well, at the beginning, Peter said it's very important to go see eclipses. So I thought, we, okay. We expect Fantastic. a full report when you get I'm back. Go. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Elaine. And that concludes the October meeting of the Central Florida Astronomical Society. So we will see you next month. I hope to see some of you on Friday, November 12th at our next star party. Hopefully the weather will be good. Until then, take advantage of these uh, more and more frequent bursts of, uh, of clear weather that we're having. Uh, stay safe, be careful, treat people well, and um, make sure you brush your teeth before you go to bed. Bye-bye. See you, everybody. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Great meeting.